All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to week two of the Together We Build virtual town hall series. We had some great discussions last week about four different program specific areas of planning for the new Windsor Essex Acute Care Hospital. And tonight, we continue that conversation with a look at the future of surgical services. And before we begin, let's respectfully acknowledge that the Windsor Regional Hospital occupies the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of the Niswi, Ishkoden, Anishinaabeg, the Three Fires Confederacy, Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi. We acknowledge the land and the surrounding waters for sustaining us, and we are committed to protecting and restoring these lands and waters from environmental degradation. On behalf of the project management team overseeing stage two planning for the new hospital, we are pleased to welcome everyone joining us tonight via Zoom webinar. I'm Allison Johnson, Manager of Communications and Community Engagement for the project and your moderator for this conversation. Tonight, you'll have the opportunity to meet some members of the user group designing the surgical services department for the new hospital. You'll have the opportunity to learn about the work that they're doing and to ask questions. The Q&A portion will take place at the end of tonight's presentation, but you're welcome to post questions anytime throughout by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and typing in your question. We'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible tonight. And please note, the focus of this town hall is stage two planning of surgical services. So this includes items related to the physical structure of the department, its layout, other services that need to be located nearby, design features and technologies. So to maintain the flow and focus of the conversation, please ensure your questions are related to this topic. Following tonight's conversation, we also invite you to visit our engagement platform, togetherwebuild.wrh.on.ca, where you can ask any further questions, take a survey related to surgical services and share your ideas. And now I want to introduce you to our panel guest for tonight, and thank you all for being with us again tonight. We have Rosemary Petrakis, Vice President of Surgery and Perioperative Services, Jen Traculia, Director of Perioperative Services, Lucy Brune is a partner at Agnew Peckham Healthcare Planning, and she's been working closely with this user group. Ed Ruckel, a patient representative working with the Surgical Services User Group. Dr. Andrew Petrakis is a general surgeon and director of clinical services planning. And Paul Landry is project director for the new Windsor Essex Acute Care Hospital project. And Paul is going to start us off tonight with a bit of context about the planning process that we're following and how the work we're doing will shape the future hospital. Paul. Thank you, Allison. I'd like to start off by thanking all of the uh, community participants who are taking the time uh, this evening to join us for this uh, virtual town hall meeting, focusing on, of course, the surgical services program um, as we are developing the functional program for uh, the new hospital. And I'd also like to say that it's uh, indeed an honor and a privilege to be a part of the planning of this uh, new mega hospital for uh, Windsor, Essex. This first uh, slide that I uh, just wanna provide a a brief overview of uh, is a slide that um, that presents uh, the four remaining stages out of, of course, five um, that that we are following. It's the Ministry of Health's um, a five stage capital uh, development uh, process. We are currently in uh, stage two. The next uh, the, the next slide will will outline the components of stage two, which essentially include the development of a functional program that we're doing now, followed by uh, the onboarding of architects and engineers this summer, who will translate that functional program into block schematic plans. We'll do a an updating of the preliminary cost estimate near the end of the year and a submission to the ministry um, early next year. Stage two is furthering uh, the design documents into what we call the development of um, indicative schematic plans and also the development of the procurement documents to go out to the marketplace to select a developer that will include 
uh, contractors, but also a design team that will take our indicative schematic plans and develop them into detailed working drawings for construction, which occurs in stage five. Um, so if all goes well, and you will notice the arrows between the different stages, those are the submissions to the ministry. The ministry reviews our plans, uh, issues, comments, adjustments, uh, and, then, uh, and then gives us approval to move into the subsequent stage. Um, you'll also notice that if all goes well with this planning process, we hope to get the shovel in the ground in the summer of 2026 and with an approximate construction period of four years, we hope to have the uh, project completed by the summer of 2030. The next slide, I think I've touched on already, but uh, indicates what we're currently doing now, which is the development of a functional program. And Lucy Brunn will uh, provide a presentation on that and, and give us a good overview of what that entails. Um, which is really describing each and every service that goes into the hospital, the volumes and activities that drive the scope of that service, and ultimately a very long list of spaces. Each, every single room required, every washroom, every office, every conference room, every patient room, of course, all the treatment spaces, so thousands of rooms. Um, that make up the functional program to then guide the architects into the next phase of work, which is the development of those block schematic plans that I referred to earlier, which will occur this fall, and then the uh, updating of the preliminary cost estimate by year end and a submission to the ministry early in the new year. Back to you, Allison. Thanks, Paul. And as part of that stage two planning that Paul mentioned, we have 40 user groups who have been meeting to develop the, the uh, functional plan for the specific areas. And they're slowly starting to take shape and build um, as we move through the process. And uh, Dr. Andrew Petrakis is at the table for most, if not all of those meetings, definitely all of the clinical meetings and um, is helping uh, specifically tonight talking about the surgical services. So Dr. Petrakis, I want to know when we talk about the surgical services, what areas of the hospital are we looking at tonight and how does this fit into the bigger picture when planning a new hospital? Thanks, Allison, and good evening, everyone. I just want to echo what Paul has already said on behalf of all of our functional planning groups, which numbers around 40, as Allison said, I would like to thank our community participants for being here this evening, uh, for them sharing their comments, suggestions, and questions regarding planning of surgical services. For this evening's town hall, we'll be discussing surgical services such as state-of-the-art operating rooms, uh, something that we haven't had before, hybrid operating rooms where complex such as vascular and neurosurgical cases will be carried out with surgeons and radiologists, uh, post-anesthetic care units where you recover from your anesthetic, uh, surgical daycare, and uh, consideration of distribution of outpatient surgical services between the main campus and double light campus. Uh, key relationships are being identified in, in planning main campus to ensure operative suites have direct access to both the emergency room, uh, the medical surgical units, uh, ICU and diagnostic imaging. All of these are important for the optimal patient experience and for the best patient care possible. Uh, important as well are the uh, outpatient surgical experience uh, that, that we're preparing for. We need to have uh, patients coming in for their uh, ambulatory surgical procedures, have easy access to the hospital, a welcoming area that they'll experience and, and feel comfortable coming into hospital for their care. All of this is, is what we're aiming for, and you'll see uh, in the next uh, several presentations how uh, we're going to go about doing this. Thanks, Allison. Thanks, Dr. Petrakis. Now over to Rosemary. Um, I want to talk about what is the vision when it comes to surgical services, and how will the design of the new hospital be better for patients when they come in for surgery? So it's really just following the stream of thought that Andrew had. The team's vision is for a state-of-the-art operating room for patients having procedures under general anesthetic. 
which has the capacity for robotic surgery and also an integrated imaging capacity. And then what we call the ambulatory procedure unit or the APU for patients that require sedation, such as endoscopy, bronchoscopy, or minor outpatient surgeries. When the teams are having their discussions, we always take the opportunity to consider what other services need to be next to the operating room. So obviously it's the recovery room, but where does the patient come in? Where is the day surgery part and the preparation part? Where do they go after the recovery room? How easy is it for their family to pick them up? What other clinical services need to surround the operating room and recovery room? And also keep in mind, is there a way we could share those services with other clinical services? So it's not duplication and using the most efficient way of space and for our patients. And it's really easy access for the patient easy access and discharge for the patient and family, and have the shared services all in one consolidated space. Jen Tricrula is the director of this area. And Jen, I wanna build on what Rosemary was saying there. When we talk about efficiency in the operating rooms, what does that mean? And how will the work that your user group is doing um, affect this in the new hospital? Thanks, Allison. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're really looking at um, just making sure that the flow in and out of the operating room, just like Rosemary had mentioned, needs to be a smooth process so that it's it's efficient for the patient, uh, the workers that are doing the work, um, and ensuring that the the time for the patient to get to the OR, the procedure to be done, their flow into the recovery room, and then to either their disposition of staying in hospital or home. Um, is, is really seamless. So we're looking at the size OR suites, we're looking at the equipment that's gonna be needed in all of them, and just making sure that the patients are well taken care of and that we're doing that with a, um, amongst everybody that's participating in the group, um, getting their input. Thanks, Jen. And we're going to hear now from Lucy Brune from Agnew Peckham. Agnew Peckham has been part of some of the largest and most recent hospital projects in Canada, including the new Coralucci Vaughan Hospital and the new Humber River Hospital. And she's been working closely with the surgical services team and is now going to talk about some of the work that they've done so far and some trends her team is seeing in planning surgical services at other new hospitals. Lucy? Great, thank you. I hope the presentation has, uh, is up on the screen now. Great, thank you. Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for this opportunity to present uh, uh, what functional programming is and uh, what some of the key trends in surgery, uh, surgical suite and procedure room uh, design is. So as part of the stage two functional program uh, development, we are looking at services at both the new hospital and the Willette campus. Uh, there's a, a saying that, um, uh, uh, the uh, size and the, uh, uh, the space uh, should follow from the functions and uh, the flows. And so uh, the major space drivers are, are what are the patient flows, what are the supply flows, um, what's the projected number of procedures that will be uh, provided, and therefore uh, how, much, uh, how many uh, rooms will be required. And of course, uh, the staffing is important because we need to know how big the, to make the lounge, the locker facilities, uh, how many workstations to provide for documentation. In terms of adjacencies, what we're uh, looking at as Rosemary and uh, Jen had mentioned is what are the departments that need to be either uh, directly adjacent or conveniently Either uh, you get to them by public corridor or by back of house support corridor. And uh, some examples would be, of course, the, uh, uh, the main entrance and where, where patients are being dropped off uh, because uh, the majority of what occurs in these areas is uh, for outpatients. Um, but also some patients after their surgery 
are going to the critical care unit or the surgical suite, or um, they may have come from a nursing home or, uh, or they may be um, going back home but uh, need transportation and uh, by ambulance, but will have a separate door, not the emergency department door uh, from which patients can, can be transferred um, by wheel trans or, or other means. And what we do in the functional program is to create a detailed space list. And the, on the right-hand side, you'll see an example of what that um, might look like. And uh, in terms of uh, some of the, uh, how we list the rooms. And then uh, as uh, Paul said, it gets translated to drawings. And on the right-hand side of, of the schematic, you'll see the, uh, an example of what a block layout is. So the architects have to lay out every room and show how, it, it, how they are adjacent to uh, the other rooms that were in the space list. We're not just looking at the projections for a few years after the day of opening, but we're doing 10 and 20 year projections. So 2028, uh, as well as 2038, because it's really important to ensure that there's flexibility built into um, the, the space that's uh, developed. And, um, and the architects, as Paul said, will be developing the, the block schematics once we've created that, that spreadsheet. So form follows function. So the first thing we list is the, the services that are provided. And we outline the key operational processes related to staff, patients, and materials flow. And one of the keys here, of course, is how do supplies get uh, to the surgical suite or uh, from the um, MDRD, which is the Medical Device Reprocessing Department, and uh, how are endoscopes processed? And that's really important when you look at the endoscopy and bronchoscopy suites. As I mentioned, the projected procedures are the basis for uh, calculating the rooms and numbers of rooms. So uh, we have to document that. Um, the staff drives the number of lockers, la size of lounge, and the number of workstations. And, um, and we list uh, all of the key departmental adjacencies. And another one, of course, is from the emergency department. And the eMERGE um, will have a large, uh, at least one uh, elevator uh, that we often call the trauma uh, elevator that would connect the, um, the emergency department to the, the surgical suite and also to the endoscopy rooms. In the space list, we organize it in terms of zones. So one of the first, the first zone, of course, would be the uh, reception uh, registration area. Another zone would be the prep recovery spaces. And of course, the operating rooms. And then a, another zone would be the, I'll call it the back of house or uh, the um, backstage areas that where we have uh, equipment storage and all sorts of other rooms that uh, are essential to make sure that the, the procedures can occur. And then uh, the space allocation list uh, lists uh, what rooms, how many, how big, and we organize them, the listing in terms of, of the, the zones. So um, the, and, and the surgical suite is one of the largest departments in terms of the numbers of rooms that, that are planned. Um, and uh, so it is also one of the most complex areas in terms of ensuring that uh, the right adjacencies within the department are achieved. So the, um, uh, there are some very important uh, contemporary planning trends that are that have occurred in um, in surgical facility planning over the last uh, I'm going to say about 15 years, and the the first is around the organization of the procedure rooms, and we talk about um, actually uh, three different types of procedures. One is the operating rooms and the uh, interventional rooms that are rooms that have imaging built into, into those rooms. And the, um, so these are procedures that are typically done under general anesthetic. And, um, and then there's also, as Rosemary uh, noted, 
uh, something we call an ambulatory procedures unit. So these are procedures that might be done under sedation, um, and, but they don't need the, all of the space and all of the processing uh, that is typically in a surgical suite. And they would typically include endoscopy, bronchoscopy, cystoscopy, uh, ophthalmology, and minor procedures that, um, that may require sedation. But in the clinics, we also have minor procedures, often called uh, lumps and bumps, and uh, they are usually under local anesthetic. So the, the categorization is dental anesthetic, uh, sedation, and local anesthetic. And that's one of the ways that we help uh, use to help organize uh, uh, the rooms. The, um, and uh, uh, the size of the procedure rooms and recovery cubicles has really changed as well over the last number of years. So your, um, one of your operating rooms right now is 300 square feet. So um, in comparison, the current standard is, the smallest would be 590 square feet. And the larger rooms for cardiac surgery, neurosurgery, orthopedics would be 650 square feet. Uh, right now, you only have one room that is uh, about 600 square feet. So in the future, all of your rooms would be at least this size. And then, of course, some of them will be over 1,000 square feet uh, because uh, they will have imaging built in. And those would be for vascular uh, cardiac, uh, et cetera. And the ambulatory procedures units, uh, rooms, an endoscopy room, even 10 years ago was re really not any larger than 250 square feet. Uh, now there are 350, 400, um, or, and, and depending on the equipment that's in it, even 450 square feet. And clinic procedure rooms have to be at least 150 square feet if not up to 250 square feet. So much larger uh, rooms. And same with the uh, recovery areas. Uh, those used to be 80 square feet. Now they're 120 square feet at the, at the uh, uh, and we have larger ones as well. In terms of infection prevention, uh, what we have now in the prep recovery areas is at least uh, one, if not two prep recovery areas that we call airborne isolation rooms. So they'd have an anteroom as well as an adjacent uh, washroom. And the, uh, their, the bronchoscopy room would be a neg uh, an airborne isolation room as well, again, with an anteroom to ensure that the negative pressure uh, is maintained. And the prep recovery cubicles um, are now actually, in many cases, have four walls around them. And that provides uh, privacy, confidentiality, as well as infection prevention. And we have more washrooms. So we program at least one washroom for every six patients. And that includes in the recovery areas where in the past, we you know, might not have programmed any. So there's a real, uh, and that what that also does is it provides flexibility and allows um, there to be capacity for patients to remain overnight in the prep recovery area, as opposed to having to be transferred to the inpatient units. And uh, in terms of operational efficiency, one of the ways that we do that is by actually integrating or co-locating uh, prep, uh, not just the uh, recovery areas, uh, for the surgical suite, but also the prep areas for the surgical suite, and similarly for the ambulatory procedures unit. Um, easily accessible support rooms like clean supplies, soil utility, medication means that the nurses take less steps or have to take less steps, and elevators that connect from the center core of the surgical suite to the um, MDRD means that there's efficient transport of uh, sterile and clean supplies, as well as soiled materials. And similarly, with the ambulatory procedures unit, we would uh, program a satellite uh, reprocessing area for the um, uh, scopes. 
And finally, what's most important of all, patient and family-centered care. Uh, one, uh, some uh, items include uh, improved and efficient registration, uh, privacy and confidentiality in all of the rooms, uh, pleasing environment in terms of light, art, wayfinding, and making sure that there is um, family waiting near the, the operating rooms or the recovery areas and uh, a place where the surgeons can speak with the families in private. So those are, are really the, the major uh, trends that we see that we've been able to incorporate in, in contemporary um, procedure spaces. And um, what, uh, what I have next is just a little schematic around, you know, how do we organize the operating rooms? So outpatients would be coming in uh, to the reception prep preparation area, they'd be prepared here and then go right into the operating rooms. And, um, and the intent here is that the entire teams comes to see the patient in one cubicle. So in the past, what has been done in design is the patient has to stop in the, in the change area, um, then sit, then speak to somebody, uh, then sit, then speak to somebody else, then sit. Um, and then wait to uh, be taken to the operating rooms. And so what, what we're really trying to do is do a one stop. Uh, here's your, you're in cubicle number one and the staff would come to you. So once the procedure is completed, then you go to the recovery area. And we also, we often call that PACU and surgical day surgery. Uh, but in fact, um, what we're doing now is programming them together. And and right next to the prep area. So there, it's like an accordion and as you, uh, all of the spaces are, are available as opposed to just little islands uh, where it wasn't possible to use the space as efficiently. And over here we have, we show inpatients because uh, we, want, we don't want the inpatients coming in in the public corridor. We want the back of the house um, non-public corridor for patients to ensure that there is privacy. And similarly, with the oh, sorry, uh, with the ambulatory procedures uh, area, uh, and I will go to um, the I, I changed it around here, and it's outpatients, uh, then reception waiting, uh, change locker, uh, prep recovery and procedure, and support areas. So while my husband is home, uh, he's not answering the phone. And yes, we do have a home line still. So this is uh, the second time this has happened. So um, I, uh, uh, it's become a joke among our group of presenters. So thanks, Allison. It only rings during a <laughs> seven o'clock right. town hall. So. Yeah, now you've got the PP that we're not home. I'm going on mute. <laughs> I do have one question for you, though, Lucy, when your phone stops there. And uh, what I took from your presentation there is that it's going to be bigger. Um, I think you said the operating rooms were almost double the size that they currently are now. Yeah. And when we talk about the new hospital and we talk about it's going to be bigger, some people like the term mega hospital, but we say yeah. it'll be if you take the two campuses and put them together and then add another, you know, 30 percent, that's about the size that it's going to be. But when you're talking about the operating space, what does that mean? What can you put in a 600 square foot room that you can't fit in a 300 square foot room? Um, good question. So in a 600 square foot room, what we have is a more is a safer environment for staff and to ensure that they uh, that the infection prevention and control is maintained. It also allows you to have equipment that is more contemporary. Um, so for example, um, you know, most anesthetists uh, would have their own uh, piece of equipment where they can dispense the, the medications from. Uh, so this in the past was not, not part of it at, at all. And um, so I think that it's you know, really about having enough space to work around the patient and, uh, and to maintain the safety. Uh, also in, in more modern operating rooms, things are off the wall, uh, off the floor. They're uh, so, you know, uh, 
uh, off the ceiling. And uh, again, that creates a safer environment uh, for the, the patients. It also gives more flexibility in, how, uh, in what surgeries occur in those rooms. So for example, right now there's a, one of the procedure rooms uh, is only used for dental procedures um, because it's so small. And um, so if, if that room's not required five days a week, it sits empty because there aren't any other procedures that can occur there safely. And uh, so in the future, when they're all sized, um, you know, at least 590 square feet, you have more, um, more capacity uh, to have more procedures per room. So greater, um, greater throughput and flexibility over time in terms of numbers of, of procedures you can do. Thanks, Lucy. Oh, as well, I just wanna to add to Lucy, there'll be more uh, opportunity and space for learners. It, it is yes. extremely cramped in our mm -hmm. operating rooms now when we have anesthesia residents, when we have medical students, we have surgical residents of, of all descriptions, uh, the, the, the space can get, get extremely cramped and narrow and it's very tight operating uh, uh, within that confined space. So we, we certainly are looking forward to these larger rooms. Great. And one of the other things, Lucy, that you mentioned was storage. And I'm thinking back, we did a, um, a survey of, of our staff and the public back in uh, November. And one of the things, one of the words that came up very frequently was uh, room for storage. So I think that that will also be welcome news mm -hmm. when we're talking about increased size and space for storage. Mm -hmm. There, uh, for equipment storage, uh, we would program uh, at least 3,000 square feet in uh, the new hospital uh, for equipment storage. So, um, and, and I think that, you know, part of the answer as well to your question is right now, because the rooms aren't large enough, uh, equipment has to be moved in and out of the operating rooms. So once the rooms are large enough, uh, the equipment can stay in and they don't have to crowd uh, the hallways and create safety challenges in terms of getting around them. Uh, by also being connected to MDRD, uh, supplies can come up uh, as needed. And, uh, and so you're keeping um, things in I'll call the le less expensive construction, which was you know, typically in, in the basement as opposed to in a surgical suite or a critical care unit. Um, so again, that, that's good, um, uh, a good way of uh, investing your dollars of, uh, of not spending it on, on uh, high intensity space with lots of uh, mechanical and electrical servicing uh, that, that may not be required. It's interesting. Thanks, Lucy. Um, we're going to uh, hear from Ed Ruckel now, who's our patient representative on this user group. But first, before we do, I want to remind everybody, if you have questions, please type them into the uh, chat section, and we're going to get to questions in just a moment. So Ed, I want to uh, turn it over to you and ask you as a patient rep, um, obviously bring an important lens to this conversation. What considerations are most important to you when you're talking about the surgical services area and why? Well, uh, well, thank you, Allison. And it's again, a pleasure to be here. I feel like I should just move in. It's been, I've been going to some of the other meetings and it's been quite enlightening because I love to learn and uh, being a patient. I'd like to start by just going back and taking about a minute to set the stage on how I wound up in this meeting and Jen, how I wound up in your surgical ward, okay? And uh, I just wanted to uh, share that with you, but I am a Canadian boy and I was born in Windsor at the old hotel, do, okay? Let you know how long ago that was, right? And uh, when I was 19, I got a green card and I left for 30 years with the United States Air Force. And because I did serve with them uh, before moving back to Canada, I was entitled to healthcare at the VA. And I'm one of those people that's been very lucky in health. I've never had a, I never had an operation. I've never had high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, nothing. I just thought I was going to live forever, right? Until 
the 18th, uh, it was a, on, in 2018, the VA did a AAA screening and it was something they were offering. I had never heard of it and I didn't want it, but I had a little Filipino doctor and I learned when they put their hips on their, you know, hands on their hips, you don't want to can challenge it any further, right? So I, uh, they did the screening and uh, that was on a Tuesday, Wednesday at one o'clock after coming back from three hours of senior tennis, I got a call from my VA provider, my doctor said they found a 7.2 aortic aneurysm. And I did not know what that was. I did not know that I was on death's door. She told me politely, get your butt to the hospital now. Don't wait, go. And I did. I went to Met to emergency. They did a CT. They confirmed it. Operation was done on the 4th of July, which I thought was kind of patriotic on the part of my vascular to do that, you know, considering my military with the Americans. And uh, anyway, I survived it. And I had, and a compliment, Jen, to your staff, I had the perfect patient experience. And I didn't coin those words. My surgical team did. Every morning, they would come up to the end of the bed and say, oh, I just thought I'd drop in and visit the perfect patient. I had no idea what they were talking about. You know, I mean, you're sitting there in la la land and I'm having a good old time. I haven't felt pain in about a year or something like that, right? And uh, they did that for six days. Even the uh, uh, anesthesiologist came in and bought their buddies with me. I brought my buddy in. So I never did figure out what they meant or why they said that, why it was coined. But because they did, I wound up on the patient experience task force, as well as uh, on this panel. And I've always been driven by the perfect patient experience. So if I were bringing something to the surgical ward, I had that perfect patient experience, probably because I didn't have a clue what they were about to do. <laughs> you know what I mean? And my surgeon wouldn't tell me what they were about to do, except that I was going to be okay. And uh, luckily, I had good health. And I brought that to the table with me. So the surgery went really, really well. And all through the seven, almost seven days that I was in there, I never experienced any pain at all. But every time I turned around, there was another nurse, another doctor, somebody popping through there uh, to check on me to see how I was doing. And what I learned after four years, and it's only been the last, about the last six months, okay, is that. I got to know the staff. So if I were talking to patients and I do that regularly with the VA in Detroit, I've been volunteering over there for about nine years now. And I work with the uh, patient experience task force people building up the perfect patient experience and uh, customer service is to let the patient know that they're a partner in this. This isn't just Jen, your people, or it isn't just the nurse or the doctor or my vascular, right? It was it's a it's a journey that everybody has to take, and you want you have to partner with your health care team, and you got to have a little bit of knowledge. And I I mentioned that to my vascular, and uh, uh, and he said, no, you don't want to be doing that. Don't go looking for trouble. So I thought, well, I won't go looking for trouble, which I'm kind of glad that I didn't. I went looking after right? Because I thought it was safe. But I, I think it, I'm just going through some notes here that I did down here. I learned a number of things. One, it was a total surprise that I had this. I, you know, I was one of those that thought I was going to live forever. But I learned that just because you're healthy doesn't mean you're well. And that came from the education, okay? When we got to the hospital, and of course, I, was, I said it was done at the Olette campus, the, uh, uh, the, the surgery was just perfect. My wife was very happy. Everything went perfectly good. I couldn't have asked for something better. My next door neighbor in the same room, he wasn't so lucky. <laughs> okay, I don't know what his problem was, but I was having a grand old time. And uh, uh, so I guess what I'm saying here is if I'm looking here for some focus on what we could say, what would I do? I think I brought a lot of knowledge in from the VA. So I had a lot of, of knowledge to bring to the table, but I got to apply it in the, in the room. Once I got up into the recovery room, got up, was it on the sixth floor, I believe? And I got in there. Uh, I actually gave out 110 cards 
uh, to thank the staff and hand delivered them because that's how grateful. That was a new word I added to my vocabulary was grateful. And I want to stop you there for a second and bring it back around to the new hospital uh, right. discussion. So how are you taking that experience and, and looking forward to the new hospital? What's well, that I, experience like being part of the user group? Well, if I were, if I, I again, I would take that per, patient orientation. And it's kind of hard to say, well, I had this problem or that problem. I didn't. I didn't see anything that I would improve except uh, to keep get patients knowledgeable about you know experiences that they may have i wish i could say well i i, I would make sure that there was some good lighting right i i never noticed anything like that actually i i walked in there and and i saw all these people and i said are those sold for me and they said yes i thought oh this is going to be a long trip so i wish i could say that i had a lot to offer in that respect but i think if anything i would Patient orientation would be one big one, okay, that we would want to bring to the table to make sure patients are oriented. I think access, uh, I think, Rosemary, you mentioned that, but access, location, wayfinding are the top three that I would deal with. Maybe there's a little bit of literature. I don't know. I never had it. Sometimes that's a little dangerous too, but I definitely uh, would be location and uh, access to the way to the the various locations as well as the uh, uh, wayfinding and I know we're working on some of that stuff now for the new hospital we're looking at wayfinding and digital mapping and all that stuff so uh, I, I hope that helps a lot I had a lot more to talk about and I realized that's not what they want to know but um, yeah that's where I'm at I, I think that focus on those <laughs> top three it would have to have I de you know, easy wayfinding to the surgical areas. I remember you were saying it or somebody was talking about it. I was hopping all over the place. I'd go here and sit. I go here and I'd have to sit again. Then I change clothes and go over there and sit. Then I got this bag of clothes. I don't know what to do with it, but my wife seemed to know what to do with it. Then I lost her. <laughs> I had to go back and find her somewhere. But uh, yeah, so I we know that's the old. Yep. But I, yeah, sort of a, in the Marine Corps, they got follow the footprints. So we want to follow those yellow footprints from one location to another. You do that at Met a little bit, I believe. Yes. And I know that wayfinding is really important to you and that you've done, uh, had some really good conversations uh, and appreciate your help with that. And again, I want to encourage everybody. Um, everybody has a story, um, maybe not quite like Ed's. Uh, Ed, who I think is broadcasting uh, to us tonight from the International Space Station. Uh, <laughs> Just <laughs> not, the best by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. but, but your story really does help inform some decisions that are made. And I really want to encourage everybody out there who's listening listening tonight who has their own story to please visit our website and uh, participate. Uh, following tonight's town hall, again, we do invite you our website togetherwebuild.wrh.on.ca. There you can provide input into surgical services the same way that Ed does, also 11 or 10 other areas of uh, planning for the new hospital. Yep. So thanks, um, Ed. I might add one thing, I just looking at my note that I never did explain and maybe this is an add on to uh, what would I like to see in the hospital, but it all boils down to if I was to duplicate that patient experience, it would be the complete absence of pain points. And I don't mean just physical, I mean emotional and mental health. So yep. those are things that would have to be factored in making this a perfect patient journey. And we appreciate uh, everything that you have been bring to the table to uh, keep those that in focus as we go through the planning process here. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Ed. I do want to turn now to uh, some questions. We have uh, a couple here. Um, please, if you want to, to ask a question tonight, make sure that you get those in before we wrap up tonight. Uh, first question uh, from David, and I'm going to address this one to Paul. David wants to know, um, does a welcoming area and easy access mean segregated multiple specialized entrances? And if so, does that mean a duplication of administration? Paul? Thank you, Allison. Um, that, that's really an excellent question. And it's a question that applies to all of the clinical services. And of course, the arrival experience of patients, um, you know, entering the front door of the hospital. And for any of our community participants this evening that have visited new hospitals recently opened, say in the last 
10 years, um, like the Oakville Trafalgar Hospital or the new hospital in Vaughan um, or the Humber River Hospital. It's really a complete different experience than entering one of our older hospitals. Um, and what I mean by that is the lobby areas in some of these uh, newer hospitals are much more open. They usually have a higher volume of space, they're airy. Um, and and in, some, in some instances, you're really struck by the welcoming desk that is sometimes um, staffed or manned, maybe a better, better term, um, by volunteers ready there to greet patients and families that are arriving, ready to assist them to find the service that they're going to. We know that when patients are coming to the hospital, it is usually for uh, a procedure uh, of some kind, a visit. The experience can be an anxious one, can be a somewhat troubling one. And we wanna create an environment that is welcoming. And that's what we mean by a welcoming um, area and easily, easy access you know, into uh, the main hospital uh, or the uh, main lobby area of the hospital. Um, but in addition to that, and Ed touched on it in his comments of wayfinding, we talk about, we use a term intuitive wayfinding because when you walk into the main lobby, it should be very clear how you get to the main public elevators if you can't mm -hmm. immediately see them when you walk in to that main lobby. And that is often the case, a whole central bank of elevators, they're, they're very close by and you can get to them very quickly. And those elevators should be able to take you to some of the key clinical service areas of the hospital. So should be able to take you directly up to say the outpatient services of the OR, you know, as an example, up to the inpatient units. Uh, and so that experience of how you navigate the hospital should be very intuitive. We also talk about a main street concept, the spine that sort of joins the main arrival point, the, the main lobby with other very key areas of the hospital. Um, there's a reference to, you know, will there be multiple, you know, main entrances? Um, I wouldn't say there'd be other main entrances, but two very important entrances will also be the cancer center that will, that will be a, an attached uh, building to the main hospital. It will have its own dedicated entrance. It will have its visibility as, as most cancer centers do have in new hospitals um, across the province. And of course, there's always a debate, what's the front door of the hospital? Uh, is it the main entrance or is it the emergency department? And the emergency department is again, another very important entrance to the hospital and one that we have to pay a lot of attention to in terms of that arrival experience and sufficient space to come into the department to, 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 to meet um, you know, with, with someone at the triage desk and then move your way into, you know, into the emergency department. And another significant entrance is the staff entrance, not treated like the other ones, but still quite important. And we know from the COVID-19 experience, when we're screening on arrival and people are leaving, we have to have separate separate flows uh, of people, whether we're talking about patients or family or we're talking about staff members. So a lot of attention is going to go into these arrival experiences and departure experiences for our patients, um, their families and, and the staff. Um, so that's what we mean by uh, a welcoming experience that is, that is airy and, and is comfortable, not intimidating. Uh, I mean, if you go to the if you go to the Oakville Hospital, I was so struck when I visited the Oakville Hospital se several years ago. There's a piano in the main lobby, mm -hmm. and you know, there's there's um, in some hospitals they have. And there was a comment here this evening in the in the chats about you know a biofilter wall, a gr a green wall, and that connection with nature we know is a, is very important in the design of 
of new of new hospitals, as is, of course, an abundance of natural light and that connection with uh, with the outdoors. So um, I, I hope that I've answered uh, David's questions with regards to the welcoming uh, area and uh, e and easy access. I think so. And I think but it's exciting when you start to look at other hospitals that are out there right now and exactly what you were saying about the light and the access to nature. You see it in different ways in uh, so many new hospitals, including uh, one of the recent ones that uh, Paul worked at when he was showing some slides when he came to Windsor of the Shoom. And it was just really um, neat how you integrated uh, the aspect of nature, the aspect of lighting, and also the uh, community that it was in. So it is fun when we get to that that point and we start to talk about how we build this hospital that has all of these uh, features that are required, but also what it can look like and how it can take shape to uh, represent who we are as a community. Uh, I, Ed, I saw you had your hand up there. Oh, a question. Paul, something you had talked about. Are you thinking somewhere along the line of a valet assist entrance <laughs> for our most senior disabled vets? You know, it Ed, anything is possible. And, and um, you know, the conversations that we're having at all of these planning tables, you know, the, um, the comments I made about, you know, the welcoming, um, the welcome area and, you know, the whole arrival experience. Uh, we have a town hall meeting with that group next Wednesday evening on the public areas. And so we're, we're having very good conversations right. with, you know, volunteer services and, and, uh, and, and what kinds of services that they might, you know, provide in, in the future. Uh, I'm not sure that they'll be willing to provide valet services, but, you know, um, the concept of valet, uh, you know, we think of as, as hotels, but when it comes to, but when it comes to seniors, um, you know, um, we have to look at, you know, how to, how to provide assistance to them in whatever capacity that, you know, that they need. Um, and I think that that when we talk about the arrival experience, we're not really just talking about when you open the front doors. Right. You know, we usually when we're planning, we usually look at uh, what's the experience like from about 100 meters away from the hospital. You're arriving in your vehicle. Where am I going? Uh, you know, I'm nervous. Uh, how, how do we make the signage? How do we make the access to you know, the front door to drop someone off and then from there go and park and, and come back that, you know, that whole experience, how do we make that as easy, simple uh, and straightforward as possible? Because if we're truly designing this hospital, planning this hospital to be patient and family centered yes. and focused, it's about the whole experience, as you pointed out. Um, it, it's about what the patient needs in their journey within the hospital, but it's also about what the patient needs to access the hospital and, right. and, and to head back home. Yeah. Oh, that's a very good point. And we, we uh, experienced that a lot at the VA. You got your 95 year old World War II guys, not many of them left now, but you know, they're driven by their daughter who has to, as you said, go find a place to park, then gets a ticket that has to be validated and then find her 95 year old guy who yeah. needs a wheelchair. So right. it's kind of, I'm looking forward to that. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Yeah. It is a unique opportunity to look at each of the steps in the journey, oh. like you said, even starting from before. And I mean, if you compare that to what, what's here now and you look at the parking situation at either of our two campuses, um, you're starting out frustrated and you're starting out far away from yeah. where you wanna be. And that's an opportunity. Uh, parking was another one of those uh, words that appeared a lot in the survey uh, when we asked people what they wanna see, so. Oh, I believe it. And you know, <laughs> final thoughts from me guys, and that is we need to think about the journey before getting to the hospital, because mm -hmm. Paul, you hit on it just a note, not necessarily a hundred feet from the door, but 40 miles away because the journey starts from home. That's right. Absolutely. And they're already mad when they get to the hospital. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. I hope they're not mad, just maybe a little anxious. I, just, we, I, did, I just blame it on you. And that, and that we can't prevent, but we'll, yeah. we'll have to deal with if there's any madness because we want to facilitate all kinds of things like pre-admission and, uh, you know, there electronic you registration and, and things that we can do from a distance. And, and that's part of what this is all about. We're focused right now on, 
you know, what are our space needs? And then, you know, how do we start to assemble the blocks of what the hospital would look yeah. like? But eventually we're going to get right into the details of, you know, operating issues and so on. Well, it's going to be an exciting time. I'm going to move on to a question now. Um, this one's for Lucy. Um, when we talk about a new hospital, we talked about um, a new means of air handling, HVAC separation. How will this be done in the new hospital and specifically in operating rooms? So I'm not a mechanical engineer, so I, I can't answer uh, the question specifically uh, other than to say that there is uh, one of the, the things that is going to guide our work is the something called CSA Z8000-19. So the CSA has a hospital committee and they have been working for, I'm going to say, uh, almost uh, 10 years uh, to develop these standards and guidelines that have been uh, used in hospital design across uh, Canada. So I can say in terms of HVAC and operating rooms is that the air exchanges, the number of air exchanges um, is, I believe, 20 an hour. So every five minutes, the air changes, and it's also positive pressures uh, going uh, over the, the patient as opposed to uh, negative pressure. So the, um, it, it, your question will absolutely be addressed during stage three uh, of planning, and, uh, and, and that's where all of the different types of specialists will be um, you know, incorporating all of the, uh, the learnings uh, that are certainly ongoing in, in hospital design. And Paul has something to add to that. Yes, uh, thank you, Lucy. Um, I am not an engineer either, but I have been around a few you know, hospital planning and development uh, projects. And you're, you're quite right in terms of the number of, you know, air exchanges in an OR and, you know, the laminar flow curtain around the OR table, right? It, it, it almost creates an air of wall, really, which, which keeps that surgical area, you know, a very clean, uh, you know, from penetration from around it or, you know, outside of that, outside of that curtain wall. And of course, the help of the HEPA filtration behind, you know, that circulation of air, right, and, and keeping that air absolutely, uh, absolutely pure. And the systems are such that they're controlled per OR, right? So very large, you know, mechanical air handling systems and filtration systems to provide the, the highest air exchanges and the purest air possible, you know, into the, uh, into the OR environment. And in terms of circulation of air, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention that in uh, certainly in the Shum project in, in Montreal, uh, in all of the rest of the hospital, in patient rooms, in all other areas, there were six 100% fresh air exchanges per hour. Um, so it speaks to the issue of oxygen. <laughs> it speaks to the issue of how clean and how fresh you know, the areas in these, in these new buildings, which, which makes, I think, quite a difference uh, when it comes to the patient experience, you know, in, in, in inpatient rooms even. And then beyond that, Lucy, you could comment on, you know, the isolation rooms and the need for isolation rooms and mm -hmm. how these mechanical systems are capable of, you know, addressing, you know, airborne uh, issues. And we will have the capacity in the new hospital to actually turn on or off, um, you know, uh, negative positive airflows for really a whole, a whole section of an inpatient unit or even a whole inpatient unit itself. So those mechanical systems are really light years beyond uh, what, what we were able to do when the older hospitals were built 50 and 60 years ago. And uh, thanks, Paul. And after SARS uh, in 2003, we uh, did a, a survey of our, our clients and um, brainstormed around what we should be doing differently in terms of hospital planning. And we did the same thing as part of, uh, in terms of COVID and, and I'll address uh, Paul's, uh, is it Paul Lachance's question uh, at the same time. 
So uh, our research is called uh, Facility Implications of COVID. Uh, we talked to all of the newest hospitals that had been recently developed. And our question was really about what do we need to change and how we program hospitals. And, um, and so we have, uh, uh, after SARS, it was identified that we needed an airborne isolation uh, operating room. So an operating room that, for, for example, could be used to, uh, to operate on SARS patients or patients with TB. Um, and what it, this OR would ensure that uh, those germs would not go out into the hallway or into the clean sterile core. Um, we also added more airborne isolation rooms. So uh, for every uh, OR or procedure room that's negative pressure, we would have two uh, prep recovery areas that were uh, also uh, had the capacity to isolate the, the patient. As I said, the uh, cubicles are, are no longer just uh, open bays. Uh, they allow for contact isolation. And, uh, and then from a flexibility perspective, uh, what we're, you know, we, um, where there's, there was a need for additional beds uh, within the hospitals, uh, the prep recovery areas in the surgical suites uh, could be used for that additional um, bed capacity because they were in fact in closed rooms. And um, so that, uh, uh, so those are, are the things that, that, you know, certainly come to mind as it, it relates to the surgical suite. And I could talk for a long time about other things uh, in other areas that, that we've changed uh, as a result of our learnings from, from both SARS and, and COVID. And I do want to mention um, for our French speaking community and members of our French speaking community that um, we are um, taking questions in uh, French and English as part of our town hall series and uh, Paul did address that question in both French and English so Lucy um, provided a, a great answer in English but I'm going to turn it over to um, Paul now uh, to answer uh, the question in French and Paul maybe you want to read the question as well. Sure, merci Alison. Um, la question en français uh, se pose, um, la pandémie nous a obligé de faire les choses différemment. Quels sont les changements dans le design des services chirurgicaux uh, que nous verrons dans le nouveau site? Changements qu'on ne voit aujourd'hui dans nos hôpitaux. Donc, ma réponse uh, brièvement, uh, est-ce que... Uh, Uh, Lucy Brown vient de, vient de nous partager en anglais, serait de dire que um, avec SARS et aussi avec uh, uh, la, la COVID-19, la pandémie que nous, uh, que nous vivons, uh, presque passée à travers, nous espérons, um, nous a appris uh, plusieurs leçons. Donc, uh, il faut absolument uh, faire la séparation uh, de distance uh, entre nos arrivées uh, patients ou, uh, ou membres de famille, mais à l'arrivée aussi dans, dans tous les services uh, cliniques uh, en face uh, d'une pandémie uh, uh, future uh, possible. Et donc, uh, dans, dans le, le, le service, uh, disons, de de, de chirurgie, euh, chirurgie d'un jour ou, ou, même, euh, ou même chirurgie euh, même jour euh, arrivée. Euh, comme Lucie l'a mentionné, euh, les chambres de, de patients ou les, euh, on dirait les, euh, ce que l'on pensait auparavant, là, euh, disons un lit de patients euh, grandement ouvert, peut-être avec des rideaux, euh, qui était autour de ce lit-là ne, ne se fait plus dans, dans le, le, le dessin d'un nouvel, nouvel hôpital. Euh, vraiment, on, on voit au minimum euh, trois murs euh, autour du patient, peut-être le, le devant du lit du patient euh, plus ouvert, mais aussi avec la possibilité de, de fermer euh, euh, cette, euh, ce, cette chambre-là. Euh, peut-être avec un, un mur euh, vitral ou, ou, même, ou même un rideau dans ce cas-là. Euh, ce qui donne euh, 
aux patients et, et aux, aux, à ceux et celles qui, qui euh, livrent le, les soins à ce patient euh, une atmosphère beaucoup plus euh, respectueuse, privée hein, pour le patient. Et euh, l'expérience d'un patient euh, à l'arrivée euh, d'une, euh, disons, de, du département de, de chirurgie euh, ne sera plus l'expérience d'arriver à un point puis euh, d'être demandé d'aller euh, se changer euh, dans les salles, de, disons, de, de, de changement euh, et puis de s'asseoir là pour qu'après euh, une période de temps, euh, le patient est déplacé à une autre une autre chambre et ensuite une autre chambre pour éventuellement euh, rentrer dans euh, de, 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 de la salle de, de chirurgie. Donc, euh, euh, réellement, la, la pandémie nous a appris plusieurs leçons de quoi faire pour mieux euh, créer des environnements euh, plus pri privés et qui sont euh, beaucoup plus euh, gérables au point de vue, euh, euh, disons, des... Euh, euh, de circulation de, 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 euh, et, et de maintenance, on dirait, de, euh, pour de la prévention des infections. Donc, j'espère que euh, ça, ça vous donne euh, une, une réponse à, à, votre, à votre très bonne question. Merci. Thanks, Paul. Um, a question now from Pam, this one for Dr. Petrakis. How many operating rooms are we planning on and how many bays will be in the new PACU? Great question, Pam. Thanks for the, thanks for the question. Uh, we're currently working with uh, the volumes uh, of, of the base year, which is 2018-19. Uh, and based on uh, age and demographic projections, we're, we're, we're trying to calculate the total number of operating rooms that we're going to need in the future. These will be distributed between both the main campus and Willette campus. And correspondingly, there'll be a, an appropriate number of uh, PACU beds uh, apportioned to both. And hopefully, uh, when we come to our next town hall in the fall, we'll be able to provide you with exact or more exact numbers than just generalities. But suffice to say that there will be an increase in operating rooms from what we have now. And a follow-up question from Pam, will there be complete separation in PACU between adult and pediatric patients? Another great question. And I, uh, I, I think the way I can answer that is right at the moment, we're calculating the total number of, uh, of operating room suites uh, uh, and PACU beds that we're going to need. Uh, how we're going to separate or if we're going to separate those will come at a later stage of planning. Thanks, Dr. Petrakis. And final question of the night, uh, we'll address this one to Paul. And if anybody else has anything to add, uh, feel free to raise your hand. Um, how will we position surgery recovery areas for easier potential future expansion relative to the building container or relative to potential flexible space expansion? Well, thank you. Um, it's an excellent question. And actually we've, um, We've been answering a similar question to that one in a couple of our town hall meetings uh, last week. Um, it's important to point out that as we plan this hospital and, and all of its um, space requirements and we move into the development of the block schematics with the architects, we have to be mindful of future expansion, especially some difficult to expand areas. And by that, I mean the emergency department, diagnostic imaging, the OR, the cancer center, those, those expensive and hard places to, to grow. And what we have to do is position very intentionally and strategically in the design, some soft spaces right next to those harder department spaces. And by soft spaces, I mean offices, storage rooms, as Lucy pointed out, you know, will be throughout, throughout the facility. We put them in those, in those areas so that we can grow the harder areas like the surgical suite uh, and other services that, 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 uh, that the surgical suite, you know, depends on in terms of 
uh, PACU re recovery and, and, and so on. So as we're developing the block schematic plans and the built building massing, we're developing what's called a master building plan. And what we challenge the architects with is to, as I like to say, future-proof the building, really look at intentional design strategies of how we do just what I've described there. And that is to, to be able to stress test certain areas and really have a very intended growth pattern for those, for those departments well into the future. Um, so that, that's what we'll be doing in this, uh, in this next, next phase of design and that we'll keep doing right until we have the final design and the developer on board to construct the new hospital. Thanks, Paul. And thanks everyone for your questions tonight. Um, this was a great conversation. Uh, and before we wrap up tonight, I do wanna check in with our panelists to see if we've covered everything or if anybody has anything uh, additional that they would like to add tonight. So Allison, the, um, the, tonight we got to meet our team. Most important, we got to hear from Ed, our patient participant. You learned about the process. Now we need your input and your suggestions and to continue with all your questions you have. Let us know on the Together We Build site link. And to all the participants, thank you for joining and your, for your questions and please keep them coming. You're on mute. I'm on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Rosemary. And what a great note to end on tonight. Please keep them coming. We do appreciate we've had lots of visitors to our engagement site. Please take the time to visit if you haven't already. When you're there, take the time to check out all of the different areas where you can provide input, share your ideas. We had some great ideas uh, tonight that were uh, placed in the chat section. I do encourage you to share those there. Um, what we're going to do is compile all of those and um, share them with our user groups, share them with the architects that are brought on board in the next stage. And then when we meet uh, back here in the fall, um, you'll have the opportunity to see how your suggestions are um, informing the planning. And then hopefully one day when you come into the new facilities, uh, you can see them then as well. So we're back here tomorrow, same time, same place. Tomorrow's conversation looks at the future of the cancer program. I hope everybody will join us. And until then, I hope you have a great evening. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you. Take care.